There is a moment when the sun disappears, when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when the night comes out. Episode 7, Mythos, Part 1 H.P. Lovecraft was a man who created some of the greatest monsters to ever exist within fiction. But what if he really had just tapped into something else? What if he knew that just beyond this world, separated by just a thin, paper-like film, there was a world of long dormant sleeping monsters. Monsters which once ruled this planet and much of the universe. For a hard-bitten private eye like the man we'll meet in our next tale, it would be hard for him to believe such a thing was real. Then, one of his oldest friends is found murdered and things start to break apart for him. Soon, whole new worlds, new possibilities will be shown to him. Not all of it good, either, because reality is often scary when the night comes out. Chapter 1. Good Day Turned Bad it was one of those Chicago winter days that you hear people who aren't from Chicago complain about. They use it as a reason for not wanting to live in Chicago, as if the people who do live there have some sort of masochistic streak. What most don't realize is that we Chicagoans actually take a kind of pride in surviving the harsh winters. Chicago is not the frozen tundra that so many people seem to think it is, complete with polar bears walking down Michigan Avenue. I was feeling pretty good for a day as gray as it was. Most people do start to suffer some kind of seasonal affective disorder, but the winters here seldom got to me in the same way. I actually preferred bundling up and wearing baggy winter clothes. I considered it a public service since the less of me that was publicly visible, the better. So I was actually enjoying the bite of the wind against the skin of my face as I stepped out of my modest three-bedroom apartment and walked the block to my car. It usually bodes well when my car manages to start without stalling or protesting too much, so I figured I was in for a good day at the office when my car started immediately. The sun was just starting to peek over the tops of the houses, and traffic was already heavy as usual. Chicago seems to run a kind of constant rush hour during the week. I had my own business, but I like to keep a tight schedule and try and show up on time. I had one employee, and I like to set a good example. Of course, my secretary offered me little to no respect, but that was okay since I pretty much encouraged it. I was hardly a tough-as-nails boss. I spent much of my time out on assignments anyway, so I just asked that she be there to answer the phone and make sure I got my messages. As far as that went, she did a great job. Today I was planning on spending the day in the office. As a private investigator, I often had days where most of my research was done online. These days I was getting hired more and more to do background checks instead of following cheating spouses. I had software that allowed me to check into almost any area that was generally of interest to my clients. I tended to let the background checks pile up a bit so that when I had a day like this, I could spend it in the office and stay relatively warm. I liked the fact that I was able to find an office that was not only affordable but also close to where I live. While the rest of the city was climbing through traffic, I just had a short 20-minute ride and I was at work. Of course, on the days when I did have to go into the field or head downtown, I was just as screwed as the rest of the citizens. 
but most of the time it played right into my hands. I was at the office in no time that morning and once again was looking forward to my day. I stopped in the nearby 7-Eleven and decided to get a cup of coffee. I sipped the hot liquid and closed my eyes for a moment as I stepped out into the cold air again. I enjoyed the psychological caffeine rush almost as much as the actual rush that would come once it had worked its way throughout my system. I walked maybe 20 yards to the front door of the office. I took my keys and unlocked the door and pushed against the heavy wood and glass door. It opened with its usual protest, and then I opened the inner door and started up the sharp incline of the stairs. My legs were aching a bit by the time I got to the top, but I was still feeling good and I took another gulp of coffee. I was early and I knew that Tracy would not be in just yet, so I found the key and opened the second wooden glass door for the morning. I smiled, like I usually did, at the sight of my name stenciled on the smoked glass, and then swung the door inward. This was home, and it felt good to be here. The place was warm, heated by old radiators that I had little, if any, control over as far as temperature. I took off my coat and put my lunch in the small fridge. I looked over Tracy's desk and shook my head at the clutter there. She freaked out every time I attempted to clean up her desk, using the fact that it was one of the first things any client saw when they walked in, as she claimed she had some kind of order to the chaos I found there. I made my way into my office. There was an inner door which was used mostly for files and records. I also had a server computer there, and that was what amounted to our technology center. My office was the last room in the place, and I had a large wooden desk that faced the interior of the room and the windows that overlooked the busy street and lumber yard that was across it. I sat down at my desk with a satisfied grunt and enjoyed my coffee for a bit longer as I waited for my computer to warm up and do its thing. I reached over and grabbed the phone. Our phone system was far from advanced. The only way I could check to see if we had a message was by picking up the phone and listening for a broken tone to the dial tone. Just as my computer blinked into life, the telltale beeping in my ear confirmed I had a message. This was far from abnormal. Too bad, however, that the message waiting for me was about as abnormal as if a yeti had walked into the room. In the span of seconds, my day went from excellent to disastrous. I knew the voice, and I checked the time. It had been left mere seconds before I had come up the stairs. While I was walking to my office, my friend, Darian Wade, with the Chicago Police Department, was leaving me a message that would wreck my day completely. Michael? Darian said. This is Darian. As soon as you get in, call me. I'm sorry to start the day for you with this, but I'm at your friend Carl Dabowski's home. Mike, he's dead. It looks like he killed himself. Uh, I'm sorry. Call me. I heard Tracy as she opened the heavy door downstairs and climbed up the stairs. I knew she would come in smiling and want a banner. However, I barely noticed or registered. Inside, my heart was sinking. One of my oldest friends and a former business partner was dead. My life would never be the same again. Damn, I muttered as I stared at the phone. So much for a quiet day. Chapter 2. Partners I put my coat on and immediately left the office and began the descent down the stairs. Tracy arrived and I barely noticed, saying a brief hello as I walked past. She was taken aback. Well, good morning to you too, she said, and there was an attempt to put some humor behind it. I have to go out, I said as I reached the bottom of the stairs and opened the inner door. I'll fill you in later. The cold air cut right through my face as I stepped into the street. I didn't feel like crying, but there was this hard thing in my gut, as if my very intestines had turned into some kind of lead ball. My head seemed as if it was spinning. I made it to my jeep and climbed in. I put the key into the ignition, but as soon as I did that, I felt as if I was going to faint. My breath seemed to wheeze in and out of my lungs. 
The radio burst into life and I nearly jumped out of the driver's seat. I put the heels of my hands into my eyes and rubbed them fiercely, knocking my glasses into my lap. I continued to rub my eyes until bright colors bloomed like demented flowers behind my eyelids. Eventually, my breathing returned to normal and I was able to open my eyes and look around. Despite the gray skies that roiled and moved above me, everything seemed strangely bright. Carl was a man I had first met in high school. I could still remember the first day when I saw him. He had shown up as a freshman wearing the most outlandish-looking jeans that anyone had ever seen. He seemed not to care even as the older students hurled insults at him. It had definitely gotten him noticed and made him known. Carl was a strange guy. He loved games. He and I would spend hours playing chess. I always liked the game in a sort of academic sense. Carl, meanwhile, had some real skill at the game. He actually did think several steps and several moves ahead of me, and he beat me more times than I ever managed to do the same to him. Carl loved puzzles. He loved to read mysteries and detective stories, and he had a knack for figuring out the plots well before the end of the book. He was immensely creative and enjoyed playing role-playing games and could conjure the most outlandish scenarios. We lost touch when we each graduated from college. For nearly 12 years, we were out of touch. Then, suddenly, I received an email from him and we had met for dinner. I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Carl suggested that we start a detective agency. I went off to school to get the necessary degree, and Carl figured out the puzzle of what it would take to open such a business. It turned out I had a bit of a knack for being a detective. I had no superpowers, I was not Sherlock Holmes, I had an average sense of detection, but I was good at talking to people. More importantly, I was very good at listening and found that people liked to talk to me. It was that talent that let me figure out what people were hiding. Of course, I also was a voyeur and I liked spying on people, and that always came in handy when you had to get sneaky photographs of cheating lovers or figure out if the guy was trying to cheat the insurance firm. So, for three years, we ran the place ourselves. We never had any particularly dramatic or exciting cases. However, I got to enjoy the work. Sometimes we really helped someone. It wasn't anything like the movies, but then not very much in life is. Carl, meanwhile, was growing bored with dealing with the public. He had not gone back to school to get the degrees, and so he spent much of the time back at the office looking up various things on the computer. While doing that, he discovered he had a knack for writing the detective stories he loved to read. When he showed them to me, I was honest and told him the stories were fantastic, and I knew that he was not going to be my partner much longer. Sure enough, he soon had an agent and a publishing deal, and I had to wish him well. Carl had gone on and dazzled the literary world. I read all of his stuff. I loved his characters and his stories. He had a knack for grabbing the reader and pulling them in with realistic characters. He had just the year before finally made a dent in things by appearing on a few bestseller lists. I had heard rumors that Hollywood might even be interested. As for me, I had achieved some success of my own. While there were guys with bigger private investigation firms downtown, I had managed to carve out enough of a niche that I was not hurting. I was able to live comfortably and relatively anonymously, which is how I wanted it. Carl and I drifted out of touch again, now settling for the infrequent email or social media hello. Carl did not live far from my office, which was a good thing. I still felt as though I had swallowed a cannonball. My stomach heaved as I turned the wheel of my jeep and rounded a corner. At one point, I had to pull over, lean out the window, and vomit onto the side street. I arrived at a building that looked like a large brick cube. Inside, I knew were a series of one-bedroom apartments. I also knew that the landlord intended to turn the apartments into condos in a few months, and that Carl had decided he had enough money to actually purchase one. He had emailed me, excited with the possibilities of owning his first home. 
Now, the building was surrounded by police cars and police tape. I found a place to park down the street and watched for a moment. I recognized the detective who had left me the message on my phone. He was looking around and smoking a cigarette while trying to keep a cup of coffee from freezing in the cold air. I knew he was looking for me and sighed. Inside, on the first floor, in a small one-bedroom apartment I had only been in on three occasions, my friend was dead. I knew from what the detective had told me on the phone that they had not moved the body. There was no real reason for me to even be here. I was not a cop and had never been one. I had done some work for cops in the past. The neighborhood where my office was had tons of cops and firemen living there. In fact, it was a bit of a specialty I had, doing work for cops who needed something found, needed information, needed to know something and couldn't find it any other way. So, it was out of respect for that that I was even here. I wasn't to touch anything or do anything that resembled investigating. I felt hot inside my Jeep. The wind rocked my car as if it were made of paper. I closed my eyes and then opened them to look at myself in the mirror. I thought that I looked relatively calm and professional. I sighed again and shut off the car. Well, I muttered to the steering wheel. Here goes nothing. I was quite wrong about that, as it turned out. As I stepped out of the car and into the biting wind, I could not have been more off base. With that step went everything I had ever known, or would ever know again. Chapter 3. The Body Darian saw me the moment I stepped on the sidewalk. He flicked his cigarette away in a haphazard attempt to flick it at an open garbage dumpster. He missed by a mile, and the smoking butt landed in a small pile of slushy snow. He took another drink from his cup of coffee, grimaced, and then tossed that toward the dumpster as well. This time, he was more accurate and hit the dumpster. He held up a hand and walked toward the police tape. Neighbors were now out and crowding around the tape. I secretly wished them all a horrible day and pushed forward. Cops in uniform were walking in and out of the building, and I recognized the landlord answering questions near the far corner of the building. Darian was dressed in a gray suit and had on a long coat. He was always an impeccably dressed kind of guy. Thanks, I said as I reached the police tape and he lifted it for me to duck under. Don't mention it, he replied. Just remember you really shouldn't be here. Don't touch anything and try to stay out of the way. You did me a solid a few years back, and I figure I owe you this much. He's still in there? I asked. Darian nodded. Just like we found him. Do you want to go in now or wait until they remove the body? I sighed and looked around. Soon these people would see my friend bundled under sheets and zipped up in a body bag. Then they would have a thrill they could talk about with their friends at dinner or over drinks tonight and maybe for the rest of the week. I'll go in now, I said. Darian nodded and pointed at the door to the building. I trudged through the small scrim of snow on the sidewalk, being careful not to step on any ice, and up the three small stairs that led into the building. Once inside, there was a set of stairs leading to the second and last floor, on either side were apartment doors, colored red, and most of them with damaged numbers on them. There were slushy footprints all over the floor, and puddles of melted snow dotted the lower floor. The door to Carl's apartment stood open, and I could see cops milling about inside. Several of them looked up at me when I entered, but most of them just nodded and went back to taking notes or doing whatever the hell it was they were doing. The room immediately inside the door was a large and long room. It made up a living room area and a space near the back of the room that might have been a dining room to some, but contained Carl's desk and was his work area. A left turn put you in the kitchen, which had marble-colored tile floors and was much bigger than you would have thought for a one-bedroom. Near the desk was a tiny hallway, and on the right was a bathroom, and to the left, the one-bedroom. He's in there, Darian said quietly and gestured toward the bathroom. 
I nodded and stepped forward about two steps and looked to my right. I felt the gorge rise in my throat, but did my best not to show the shock and horror on my face to the room full of cops. I felt hot tears at my eyes and tried to fight those off as well. With the tears, I was not nearly so successful. The bathroom was small. It was mostly covered with more of this thick tile that made the walls look lined with dark gray marble. The sink was nearly on top of the toilet. The shower and tub was along the far wall. Carl's body hung from a short strap that looked like a belt from the shower curtain rod. His eyes were open, but facing downward toward the toilet. His face was discolored and his tongue protruded. He was wearing pajama bottoms and a t-shirt. His feet were bare and his knees bent. His arms dangled loosely. His feet were on the floor and he had obviously strangled to death. The belt bit deep and hard into his neck, making his features appear bloated and disfigured. Jesus, I whispered. Yeah, Darian said. I'm sorry, man. I really liked his stuff, too. Were you aware of any problems he was having? Did he have debts or health problems? Or was he involved with anyone? I shook my head. I haven't really spoken to him in a while. We exchanged emails mostly, and I know he was planning on buying a condo here when these apartments are converted. He was also excited about one of his books being turned into a movie. I looked one more time at Carl's body. I figured I should have been trying to memorize the situation to find clues, but the vision was too upsetting. I turned away and walked back into the living room and office area. I noticed that most of the cops and detectives had moved out into the hallway. I looked around. There was an entertainment center with a television situated in it. There was a DVD player and a small stereo. There was a sofa along the wall and a coffee table in front of it. There was nothing remarkable about it. Then, I focused on the desk. It was a beat-up old office desk that I once helped Carl move. It weighed roughly 18 tons. On top of it was his computer. The rest of the desk, however, was clean. There were no pens or papers, and not even a paper clip. Carl was not a neat guy. He was the king of clutter, generally speaking. In that way, he was a lot like me. When I had last been here... That desk had been overflowing with papers and research and other things he used to write his books. So, do you guys think it's a suicide? I asked. Darian sighed. Looks that way. Doesn't seem to be anything pointing to anything else. Sorry to say. I shrugged. Me too. Look, I'm not feeling very well. I'm gonna head back to the office. But keep me informed, if you can, okay? Darian nodded and extended a hand. Good to see you again. I wish it was under better circumstances. I shook his hand and nodded. Yeah, me too. I turned and walked out of the apartment. I nodded at the cops and detectives in the hallway. I stepped out into the biting air and turned toward my car. I put my head down and tried not to look at any of the gawkers hoping to see some blood or a dead body. My mind was turning. Something about the desk was bothering me. It was as if someone had taken everything off of the desk. I wondered if Carl had suddenly had a fit of cleaning, or if someone had broken into his place and taken his research. Then I wondered what Carl had been working on. I got to my car and started the engine. I knew that it was very likely that I was overreacting and looking for conspiracies where there were none. However, it wouldn't hurt to maybe make a phone call or two, would it? Chapter 4. The Secretary I drove back to the office, and my head was buzzing. Of course, the desk had been cleaned off by the police. I cursed myself for not asking before I had left. However, I didn't feel that this was the case. A lot of times, you ran on instinct alone when you were working on a case— 
If I looked at a file and just got the feeling that the person involved was lying about his or her injury to commit insurance fraud, more often than not, I was right. I needed to get back to the office. I needed to talk to Tracy. She may have had the label of assistant, but she was really more of a business partner. In many ways, she took the place Carl had when he and I had been working together. Her mind was probably sharper than his was, and she was definitely able to multitask better than he had. She was great to bounce ideas off of, and she always kept me on track and probing for the right answers. It is important to note that my assistant is hot. There's just no denying it. She stands about five foot six and a half, and she assures me that half is very important. She had legs most men would kill just to sit near, and eyes that could pierce not just to your heart, but to the heart of your very soul. She also had a long, gorgeous mane of red hair that surrounded her face. She also had a quick mind, terrible typing and spelling skills, but a shocking fearlessness that made her invaluable when it came to tracking down information. When needed, I could easily sick Tracy on someone, and she would relentlessly pursue and track down the information. I broke more than a few traffic laws in my haste to get back to the office. My brain felt like it was on fire. I knew that at least some of this could have been me being completely unable to deal with the fact that my friend and former partner had just hanged himself in his bathroom. However, Carl may have been many things, but the kind of guy who would check himself out without leaving a note or doing something dramatic, he was not. I screeched to a halt near the office and nearly sprinted to the door. I ran up the stairs and then paused for a time to catch my breath at the top of them. Tracy came out the door as soon as I stopped. She had a look of fury in her eyes, the likes of which you can only see in the eyes of a redhead. Don't you ever do that to me again, she said. Carl's dead, I replied between gasps. Her face turned pale. She opened her mouth once and then again. Then she closed her mouth and bit on her bottom lip. She had only met Carl a few times, but she knew that he and I had once been partners and had always been friends. I'm sorry, she said quietly. I nodded. Let's go inside. She took her turn nodding and we went into the office. I walked through the outer office and then through the inner room. I flung myself into the office chair behind my desk and rubbed my eyes from beneath my glasses. My head had stopped spinning, but was well on its way to hurting. They found him hanging in the bathroom from the shower rod. I said. Tracy gasped and sat down in a chair in front of my desk. She was dressed perfectly, as always. She had her red hair down, and it cascaded around her shoulders— she would have looked perfect sitting at the Playboy Mansion, or perhaps waiting for makeup before posing for photos for a magazine. In short, she looked like she belonged anywhere but a tiny office for a two-bit private eye. His desk was cleaned off, I said. Carl's desk was clean? She asked with surprise in her voice. Did the police do it? I shook my head. I called and checked. It was like that when they found him. Who called the police? She asked. I opened my eyes and looked into hers. I never asked. We were silent for a moment. We stared at each other for a while. You're not buying that it was a suicide, she said. I shook my head. Not for a minute. He had too much going on. He was excited about things. He had a new book for crying out loud. He didn't even leave a note. Do you think Carl would be the type to kill himself and not leave a note? No, she said. But don't you think it might be wishful thinking on your part? I've thought of that, I said. However, I don't think it hurts to look into it a little. What do you think you'll find that the cops can't? She asked. I cocked my head to the side and looked at her. Do you really have to ask? She shook her head. Ugh, so arrogant. What do you want me to do? Someone has to stay on top of the current cases we have. I replied. 
They're all research cases. Can you handle them? She sighed. Don't I always? I smiled. And stay near the phone. I may need your help. She nodded. What are you doing first? I'm going to visit his apartment again. I said. I have this feeling there's something there. Chapter 5. Breaking and Entering I spent the rest of that day making phone calls to Carl's other friends. They were all, as you might imagine, in a state of shock and dismay. I had to comfort a lot of them and make a lot of promises to attend various memorials and services. I lost track after the fourth separate memorial service at the fourth church. However, I was able to glean some information. Namely, it was universally felt that there was no reason for Carl to kill himself. Several mentioned that Carl had been excited about starting a new book and that he had even spent time at a writer's retreat somewhere north of the city and near the lake and Wisconsin border. He apparently told several people that he felt that this book would take him in radical new directions and open his career up to new audiences. I thanked Tracy for the work she did on the current cases that I had open. When she left, I spent time at the office, waiting for the sun to go down and looking online. I spent time at Carl's website, looking for anything that might provide more information. Again, Carl had posted some cryptic messages about amazing things he had discovered that he was planning on using for a new series of books he was going to write. I was puzzled, but more convinced than ever that something was wrong. I was more convinced than ever that his death was not a suicide. When the sun was down, I put on my dark coat and grabbed a flashlight and something out of the desk I thought would get me into his apartment. It took me less than five minutes to get to Carl's apartment. The wind was blowing hard and snow crusted my eyelashes as I walked across the sidewalk and headed for the large square building. Over the years, I had learned how to pick a lock. When I first started in the private eye business, I thought it might come in handy. I bought a pick set and tried to learn on my own. It was beyond frustrating. I then found a locksmith and not only begged him, but paid him enough hundred dollar bills that he finally taught me his technique. It was far less delicate than the instruction booklets that came with the lock pick set seemed to make out. Fortunately for me, on this night, I would not need the lock picks. Carl had long ago given me his keys for safekeeping, and I opened the outside door easily with the key with the square top. The round one was for his apartment. I entered the inner hallway and listened. I could hear a dog barking upstairs. I could hear a television blaring loudly, and that also sounded like it was upstairs. There was yellow tape across Carl's door, but the place was deserted. The police were convinced this was a suicide, and they felt there was no need to keep the place guarded. I moved quickly and quietly, and was inside his apartment door in seconds. The darkness was absolute, save from light filtering through the windows from the streetlights outside. I turned on the flashlight and covered it with my hands to guide the light carefully around the room. The place looked much like it had when I had been there earlier. I made my way carefully over to his desk and began shining it around. The drawers of the desk were empty. Screws were missing out of the back of the computer, as if the back had been removed and something removed from the computer itself. After a few moments of fumbling around, I removed the casing and saw that the hard drive had been taken. I made a note to call the detectives on the case to make sure it wasn't them that had taken it, and then moved on. The darkness was getting to me. There was a strange heaviness to the room. The open window shades were getting to me as well. I kept turning and expecting to see people, faces, and eyes peering at me from the street. I was breathing hard and had to stop as I was walking toward the bathroom and force myself to calm down. I reached the bathroom and closed the door behind me. I found the light switch and turned on the lights. I shuddered as I looked at the shower curtain rod where Carl had been hanging earlier. Of course, he was long gone, but I could still sense him there. It was like he was still in the room with me. I forced myself to regain my calm and began searching. I knew that if Carl was hiding something, 
he might hide it in here. Something about this room seemed important, and I knew that I had nothing to base that on other than a hunch. I searched the tiles of the bathtub. Nothing seemed out of place. I searched the tiles of the strange gray marble that lined the walls. Again, nothing seemed patched or out of place. I sighed and looked around again. Finally, I opened the medicine cabinet and looked at the bottles there. There was nothing out of order. I slammed the cabinet door out of frustration and noticed that the entire cabinet seemed to shake. I tilted my head to the side and looked at the cabinet again. I reached out and pushed the entire cabinet. With a sickening squeak of metal against tile, the entire medicine cabinet shifted to the right. Just behind the cabinet was a small square hole in the wall. I shined my flashlight into the dimness of the hole. Inside was what looked like a small cube of wood. I reached into the hole and pulled out the smooth wooden cube. I held it in my hand and turned it around. It was definitely wood and it seemed perfectly smooth. The wood was highly polished and I could see the grain perfectly and I could not see any lines or breaks in the wood. I turned it around again and shined the flashlight on it. Once again, I could not see any break. What the hell? I whispered into the emptiness. I decided that I would need to look at this in more detail later. I opened the bathroom door and shut off the light, and just as I did so, my heart nearly leaped out of my chest. I saw a head duck away from the window in the bedroom, directly across from the bathroom. I shined the light toward the window, but the face was gone. My heart was hammering in my chest. I moved across the hall and peered out of the window. I saw a shadow move around the side of the building. Then I looked out straight toward the sidewalk and the house next door. Two men stood there staring back at me. Both of them seemed to be wearing glasses and the streetlights shone off of them. They were standing side by side staring at me, standing on the sidewalk about four doors down. Then I saw that across the street stood a woman wearing a white skirt. She was alone, also on the sidewalk about four doors down, and she too was staring directly at the window. I licked my lips. They felt like sandpaper. I swallowed and felt more sandpaper lining my throat. I turned and walked quickly across the living room, putting the small cube of wood in my inside coat pocket. I opened the door and closed it behind me and ran out to the sidewalk. I had no gun, but I carried the one illegal thing I used as a weapon. I opened the black switchblade with my right hand. I turned to the right and saw that the two men were gone. The woman was still there, but she was turning and walking away. Who are you? I shouted. The woman did not turn and look at me. She walked slowly away, her back towards me into the shadows. I started to walk after her, but then felt a kind of tingling on the back of my neck. I turned slowly and saw two more men standing across the street in an empty field that was part of property owned by a local school. They were staring at me, and, obviously, were two different men from the two who had been on the sidewalk. I ran across the street and stood near the edge of the grass. "'What do you two want?' I asked loudly. "'Who are you?' "'You should stay out of it,' said the man on my right. "'Just stay out of it.' "'Who are you?' I asked again. "'They're sleeping,' said the one on my left. "'They sleep, but they know.' You should know that. They know. What are you talking about? I asked. Keep it in mind, said the one to my right. Their voices were soft. I had to strain to hear them over the wind. Consider this a warning. They are aware, and so are we. You cannot stop what is coming. Your friend couldn't, and neither can you. They turned in unison and began walking away. I shuddered. I was tempted to go after them, but my legs refused to move. 
I turned around and ran back to my car. There was a note on the windshield. With my hands shaking, I removed the note. Stay away. You have been warned. Chapter 6 Home I ran to my car and climbed inside. I was shivering and I knew it had nothing to do with the cold. I turned on the engine and cranked the heater up as high as it would go. My hands were shaking as I grabbed the gear shift and started driving. I jumped as I became certain things were coming at me from the sides of the road. However, there was nothing there except for houses. The streets were now empty. I reached into my pocket and felt the square of the wooden cube. I shuddered again. It was just like Carl to put something important in some kind of puzzle box. He was always into games and puzzles. This was exactly the kind of thing I could expect him to do. I was tempted to pull over to see if I could open the thing. However, the shadows on the side of the road seemed to be closing in the moment I thought of pulling over. I had to get home. I stepped on the gas and drove home as fast as I could. I spent the short block walk from where I parked my car to my apartment, looking over my shoulder. It felt like there were eyes on me at every step. What the hell had Carl gotten into? How the hell could a man who was a writer get into something this odd? Who were those people? One thing was certain. I was right in believing that Carl had not killed himself. Still, there was no way I could go to the police with this. They would never believe me, and I scarcely believed it myself. I had no idea who those people were or where they had come from. The more I thought about it, the weaker my case got. It wasn't like the people who had spoken to me had admitted killing Carl. All I had seen were a bunch of people standing outside his place and two weird guys talked to me while near the building. If one of them had been holding a bloody knife or a piece of the rope that had hanged Carl, that would have been different. I entered my apartment. My dog immediately started jumping all over me. I patted her head and scratched her stomach. She wanted to go out, but there was no way I was headed back out there. She could make a mess in the third spare bedroom for all I cared. I was ready to clean up poop from a rug before I was about to step outside. My hands were shaking as I sat down on the sofa in front of my coffee table. I pulled the wooden box from my pocket. I looked at it carefully, running my finger over the smooth wood. Whoever had made this box had done an amazing job. I know that there must have been a sliding panel or hidden button somewhere, but where was completely elusive. I turned the box in my hands repeatedly, getting more and more frustrated as the time slipped by. I felt as if time was running out. As for whom time was running out for, I had no idea. I also could not shake the feeling that someone was watching me. However, I had all of the blinds drawn. I always had the blinds drawn as I lived on a very busy street and didn't want to be looked at. I shuddered at the thought of nameless and unseen eyes watching me. I forced myself to put the box down after about 20 minutes. My hands were still shaking and I was sweating. I could not figure out what exactly had freaked me out so much. I had some weird folks talk to me, and that was it. It wasn't like I hadn't seen stranger things since I chose this career. I made a note to call a man I knew who also had some ties to Carl. He was a guy who owned a hobby and game store in a south suburb. He would probably know how to open this thing. Hell, he might have sold the thing to Carl. With that decision made, I felt capable of relaxing for a bit. I even laughed at myself. I was letting things get to me. Maybe I had even hallucinated the people I saw outside his apartment. I gave a little more attention to my dog, who was burning holes in the side of my head, staring at me intently. She sniffed at the wooden box and then sneezed. She didn't seem to like it much and whined at me until I rubbed her belly. She was soon curled up and dozing next to me. When I felt I could walk again, I decided I needed something to drink. I do not drink booze, but a nice bottle of mineral water was in order. I tromped into the kitchen and found a bottle. My dog was right behind me on my heels, hoping I was about to give her a treat. I decided it might be a good time to make myself a tuna sandwich or something. 
I reached into the fridge and pulled out the mayo and pickle relish, a family secret ingredient to tuna fish, and closed the fridge. I then spared a glance out the rear window, which was right behind the fridge, and overlooked the apartment building's tiny yard and into the alley. No sooner had I done so, and I felt all of the moisture in my mouth dry up. My hands felt weak, and I nearly dropped the mayo and relish. I stepped back and stepped on my dog's paw, and she let out a yelp I barely heard. I kept backing up until the sink pushed into my hip. I reached out and pulled the string that shut off the light above the sink, and then stared out the window from the darkness. Between the gap of the garage and the neighbor's garage, there was an electrical pole. On that pole was a light, creating a kind of soft cone of light around that spot in the alley. Clearly, within that cone, and clearly staring up at my apartment, was a man. Chapter 7. Watched. I stood in the darkness and felt my heart hammering in my chest. My dog stood next to me, looking up at me with her head tilted to the side. She shifted on her paws anxiously as she waited to see if I was going to give her any food. I swallowed, my throat clicking loudly, and moved forward. I moved forward just enough until I could see the man standing there. He was standing in the snow. I couldn't see any details of his face. He must have been about the same height as me. I could see that he was wearing glasses because they were reflecting the lights of the streetlight just above him. The wind blew the long coat he was wearing around his calves. However, he seemed to not notice the cold at all. He didn't shudder, he didn't stamp his feet, he didn't shift his weight on his feet. He just stared, his hands in his pockets, seemingly directly into me. His face was hidden in shadow. I could have sworn I could feel his eyes burning right into me. My brain was an absolute conflict. Part of me told me it was time to ignore him. I should just make something to eat. I could eat the meal in the living room. I told myself that the man would likely be gone. I told myself this was all just a coincidence. This was just a drunk from the bar down the street. Or this was a homeless guy who had just picked my particular apartment to lounge behind. However, the other part of my brain told me that this had everything to do with the people who had been outside of Carl's apartment. I had no idea how they would have found my address. They hadn't even called me by name. Yet, how had they known I was in Carl's apartment in the first place? I turned and walked quickly into my bedroom. I opened my closet door as my dog jumped on the bed and barked excitedly. I dropped boxes, some baseball hats, and several pieces of clothing on the floor before my hands closed around the cardboard box I wanted. I lifted it out of the closet, set it on the bed, and opened it. I lifted the heavy black gun in my hand. I didn't own a real firearm. However, I did own an air pistol that from a distance and in shadow looked pretty real. I hoped that it would be enough to scare the guy behind my apartment. Part of me, however, hoped that he would be gone by the time I made it back into the kitchen. I was mistaken. He was still there. He seemed not to have moved. He seemed not to have even shifted his weight. The wind was whipping snow around him and bending the barren trees and the yards around him. I flung open the back door. Then I smashed open the glass outside door. I made sure the door closed behind me, shutting my dog behind me. She immediately began barking and scratching at the door. I walked to the wooden railing, and I held the gun in front of me. Who the hell are you and what do you want? I yelled. I hoped my landlord, who lived just beneath me, was not home. He smiled. I could see just enough from the light over his head to see that his face moved. You have no idea what you're involved with, he said. Kululu Fatagan, detective. He hears, and he is aware. His time is about to come. You cannot stop it, and you should not stand in its way. I shook my head. My hand, still holding the gun, was shaking as well. I don't know what you're talking about. The smile stayed frozen on his face. He finally shifted his weight in the snow. You may not right now, detective, 
but you will. You are going to be visited by someone tomorrow. I suggest you speak to him. I suggest you agree to help him. He spread his hands suddenly, as if he was blessing me and the entire backyard. We are everywhere. We are his hands and eyes. But soon, he will come. Soon we will sit by his side and he will rule the earth once again. He is the high priest, and when he comes, he will bring back all the old ones. You're a raving lunatic, I said. If you don't get out of here, I will shoot you. Suddenly, the man laughed. Despite the wind, it chilled me even more than the cold. That gun isn't real, detective. Stop playing. I felt as if he had punched me in the gut. How did he know? How could he tell? My head was spinning again. Then I'm going to call the police, I said. Go ahead, he replied. By the time they get here, I'll be gone. I just came here, hoping to speak to you. He tilted his head to the side. He reminded me of my dog. I noticed that my dog had stopped barking, which was something she never did when I was outside. I spared a glance behind me and saw that she was gone from the door. I think you could be a valuable member of our organization, detective, he said. I hope that we can work together soon. I opened my mouth to reply, but found my voice would not work. I simply backed up. I watched as he tilted his head to the other side and then straightened it. Then he turned to the left in a strange, stiff, robotic way. Then he walked off. I noticed he did not even leave footprints in the snow. I turned and found the door. I opened it, slammed the outside door shut, and locked it. Then I slammed the inside door and double-locked it. It was a long time before I was able to stop shaking and leave the door. I stood there against it, shuddering, and wondering what my friend had gotten me into now. Chapter 8. Puzzle Box I'm sorry to shatter your illusions of what a private detective is, if you grew up watching movies and television shows where guys like Bogart carried guns and faced off against big and scary bad guys, well, the real world and the real job is nothing like that. I spend most of my time in front of a computer or looking things up at the library. Sometimes I get to follow people around and take sneaky photos with a telephoto lens from the front seat of my car. Sometimes I actually talk to the people I am following, but that is very rare. Most of the time, they have no idea I am even there. Sometimes, if the job is just doing a background check, they aren't even aware that anything has been done at all. I'm like a ghost in a lot of ways. I'm not a brave guy. I'm a nosy guy. I like to pry into people's lives, and then I like having someone to report back to about it. It's just that simple. I get paid a lot of money to do it, and I've gotten very good at doing it, and I did a lot of it for cops, and that gets me on their good side but that doesn't mean I am a cocksure Braveheart. So when the guy who spoke to me so strangely in the alley walked away, I was terrified. In my defense, even my dog was terrified. The same dog that would go head-to-head -head with a Rottweiler or a Doberman had run and hid under the bed. The same dog that barks at the garbage men and other men much larger and, in my mind, much scarier than this guy, was terrified. I opened the fridge and grabbed a bottle of water. I felt the cold liquid slide down my throat. I was amazed at just how badly my throat hurt and how dry it was. I felt cold, even though the heat was on full blast in my apartment. I swear I could hear the wind clawing at the building around me, searching for a place to get in, tear open the roof, and charge at me, slicing through my bones. It was like hearing something alive outside trying to get to me. I headed for the living room, and I paused to root through the pocket of my jacket. I found the small wooden box and sat down on my couch. I placed the small box on the coffee table in front of me. Suddenly, this box was the most important thing in the world. Here is what I knew. I knew that my best friend and former partner was dead. It looked like it was a suicide. However, when I went over there, I discovered that his hard drive and materials on his desk were gone. I knew that the police had not taken the things off the desk. I had found a hidden box in a secret hiding place in his bathroom, 
the very place where he had died. I met some very strange people outside his apartment, and it appeared a person of equal strangeness had appeared behind my apartment. The police were convinced Carl had killed himself. I had no proof that these strange people had anything to do with his death. I had a strange box that may or may not have something hidden inside it, and a threat that more strange people would visit me in my office the next day. The lack of information was giving me a headache. I stared at the grain of the wooden box. I wanted so badly to see something that would indicate how to open the damn thing. I had seen similar puzzle boxes before. Carl had shown me puzzle boxes like this before. Most of the time, if you twisted it a certain way or press your finger against a certain section, a panel might slide away. Then the top would open and the inside would be revealed. I could have gotten a hammer out of a drawer and smashed the damn thing. For a moment, I considered that. The problem was I had no idea what was hidden inside it. If I smashed it to pieces along with the box, then where would I be? I would have even less evidence of anything. So I had to figure out how to open the damn thing. I picked it up and began turning it around. I tried twisting it. I tried poking every area I could find. I pressed and picked at areas of the grain and the wood that I felt looked different. Nothing seemed to open it. Without a doubt, this was the best constructed puzzle box I had ever run across. Not that I collected them or anything, but from what I had seen, this one was a doozy. I leaned back and rubbed my eyes. It was starting to get late. I needed to get to bed. However, every time I closed my eyes, I saw the face of the man in the alley. I had this sudden and certain feeling that he was standing outside my place right now. I had this feeling eyes were watching me. I was tempted to go online and try looking up some of the names he had thrown out at me. I even went so far as to pull my laptop out of my briefcase. Then, my head began to pound, and I suddenly felt exhausted. I had been through several emotional ringers, and it looked like tomorrow would be as crazy as this one. I walked into my bathroom and shook out two pills. I downed them by drinking water directly from the tap. I walked into the bedroom and decided it was a night to sleep naked, so I undressed. I made sure my bedroom door was locked and then I put a fan in front of it. I turned on the fan for the noise and laid down. I figured I would be awake for hours. I stared at the ceiling and had images of strange men in my alley and of Carl's bloated and dead face staring at me. My dog jumped up on the bed next to me and then curled up, pressed against me. Seconds later, I was asleep. I did not have any good dreams that night. Chapter 9. A Visitor I slept at best fitfully that night. Normally, had I slept that poorly the night before, I would have called my secretary and told her I was coming in late. That is one of the benefits of being the boss and having the kind of job that sometimes means staying up late. However, I had to find out more about the damp box, and I needed to find out if I had imagined the entire experience with the strange man behind my apartment, and whether or not I would have a strange visitor that morning. So I was up much earlier than I would even get up when I had slept well. My dog was looking at me suspiciously the entire time. I took her for a walk and nearly jumped out of my skin when a car backfired on the busy street that my apartment was on. I was as jittery as a poodle, and it seemed like every shadow held menace. It was cold and gray, which did not add to my mood. I was hoping it would at least be sunny. I loved the blue skies and sun during the winter. Even if it was blisteringly cold, a clear blue winter sky can lighten my mood immensely. Instead, the clouds were thick and gray and looked like they carried the promise of more snow later in the day. I dressed without even looking at what I was putting on. For a moment, I even contemplated carrying the stupid air gun with me. I realized that would be tantamount to the greatest stupidity I had ever committed and decided against it. I walked through the blistering cold with my head bowed to my car. I half expected to see the creepy man with glasses leaning against my car and walked past the opening of the alley with caution. The drive to work was short. I sat in the car on the street behind my office and let my nerves settle. It was a losing battle. I got out of the car and walked into the 7-Eleven next door. 
I bought some very hot and very strong coffee. I added a heaping amount of sugar and then paused to drink three large swallows before heading to the office. I climbed those stairs with what felt like weights on my ankles. The office was dark. I opened the door and turned on as many lights as I could. I opened the restroom down the hall. I looked at the desk where Tracy sat and wished she had gotten to work before me. I needed someone to talk to, and only she would really understand what was going on. Then, after a moment's thought, I realized she would likely not understand what was going on. I barely understood what was going on. Hello, detective. A voice said from behind me, and I am ashamed to say I let out a small scream as I jumped nearly out of my shoes. I turned and faced the man behind me. I almost let loose a laugh once I saw him, however. He was shorter than me and had a shaved head with a covering of black stubble. He wore round, wire-rimmed glasses and had the shadow of a beard and mustache. His eyes were dark and blazed as if with some kind of internal light behind the small glasses. He had a small smile on his face that was the kind of smile built and designed to melt people's hearts and remove their defenses. He wore a blazingly white suit. It felt so white that had he lain down in fresh snow and covered his head, he might vanish entirely. He wore no winter coat and did not seem even remotely cold, even though the heat in the office and building had just kicked on. Am I expecting you? I asked in what I hoped was an authoritative voice. I wasn't sure I achieved the sound I was going for. Yes, I believe you are. He said. How did you get in? I asked. That door downstairs makes a horrible racket when it is opened and closed. I didn't hear a thing. He shrugged, and his smile grew wider. I don't know. I believe in politeness. I made sure to close that heavy door quietly. I nodded. Very polite of you. Thank you. He said, and he bowed his head slightly. May I come in? Please, I said. I'm the only one here at the moment. My secretary won't be here for about another 15 minutes. I turned my back on him, feeling tingles up and down my spine as I did so, and I walked into the office. It was all I could do not to turn around and walk backwards. I did not feel comfortable with him behind me, staring at my back. Excellent, he said in his quiet and somehow disturbing voice. That will give us time to talk amongst ourselves. I reached my desk and sat down. I felt a lot of relief being able to face him again. I kept expecting a knife to enter my back at any moment when he was behind me. He was still smiling that kind of half-smile, as if the world and everyone around him just amused him to no end. He took a seat in a chair set up in front of my desk. He crossed a leg over the other and smoothed a crease in his spotlessly white pants. How can I help you, Mr... I asked. Devlin, he said. My name is Adam Devlin. What can I do for you, Mr. Devlin? I am the owner and operator of Wooden Pines Writers and Artists Retreat, which is just north of the fine city of Chicago. Have you heard of it? I shook my head. Can't say that I have. Your friend Carl did, he said. He recently spent some time there while working on his latest novel. I was very sorry to hear about what happened to him. I said nothing. Sometimes silence was better than trying to fill in the gaps. He looked at me, and that half-smile never faltered. Neither of us gave any ground, and then he shrugged slightly and continued. I need you to help me find something. It has nothing to do with what happened to our mutual friend. However, there is an item of profound interest to our group. It is an artifact, and it is very old. The artifact is rumored to lead to yet another item that is, ultimately, the goal of our organization. We collect ancient texts and books, and this item would be the prize of our collection. He smiled a wider smile. I can pay handsomely. Well, I thought. I had to admit that he now had my attention. Chapter 10. The Hunt Well, you have my attention, I said. He smiled and nodded. His smile was getting to me. 
We are looking for a document that is centuries old. It's a book, actually. It is reportedly written in human blood by a madman who lived centuries ago. It reveals, well, that's hard to say. I laughed. You want me to find a book written in human blood? Seriously? Is this some kind of horror novel? He rubbed his eyes, and the smile never left his face. He then looked up into my face. I don't expect you to know, believe, or care what the book is written in. What you need to know is that the book exists. It has been documented many times throughout history. We want it. Dare I ask why? He shook his head. As I said, we have a collection of ancient works at the retreat that I manage. This is one of the rarest around. In fact, it may be the rarest on the planet. Why wouldn't we want it? If it's that important, wouldn't it be in the collection of some private collector? I asked. No, he said. The book has power in it. Well, that is to say it is believed to have power. It contains things that most people would read and go utterly mad. I laughed again. Okay, now I know this is a joke. Did you have people follow me yesterday? Were people you sent lurking outside of Carl's apartment last night? Was there someone you sent lurking outside of my apartment? Does it really matter? He asked. He reached into his jacket pocket. For a moment, I felt my heart rate speed up to levels that made me wonder if I was going to have a heart attack. Instead of a gun or other weapon, he removed a large stack of cash. He tossed it casually on the desk in front of me. I stared at it as if it were something totally alien. Given the way most clients paid me and the kind of cases I did, it might have been an alien thing. I picked up the stack of bills. I slowly flipped through them. They were all hundreds. I was never very good at math, but it was a lot of money. It was more money than anyone had ever thrown on my desk or given me to take a case before. I have a lot more where that came from, he said. How am I supposed to locate this ancient text? I asked. That's where your friend Carl came in, he replied. There's an ancient artifact. The name is lost to history, but it is small, maybe only a few inches long. It's a small black rectangle, darker than anything you've ever seen before. It appears to be smooth until you touch it and run your finger along the edge. On there is ancient writing. That writing reveals the location of the book. I sat there and stared at him again. Time seemed to spin out. Somewhere I noted that the door at the bottom of the stairs had opened and closed. Tracy was here. I kept waiting for him to crack and to start laughing. I wanted all of this to be a dream. I also wondered if he or one of his crazy followers had killed Carl. My head was spinning. The light in the room seemed too bright and it seemed too warm. How am I supposed to read it? I asked. He slowly stood. Just bring it to me. We have ways of reading it. Then we can see about payment for finding the book itself. He started to walk towards the door to my office. I heard the door open and Tracy walk in. She walked into the inner office and stopped, staring at the strange man. Her face did not reveal her surprise, but I detected it in the way her shoulders moved. As for the man himself, he simply nodded at her and his smile widened. Good morning he said. He started to head toward the door again. I looked at Tracy and held up a finger. Oh, I said. Does this book have a name? He stopped. He did not turn around and look at me as he spoke. Yes, he said quietly, but loud enough to be heard. It's called the Necronomicon. Without another word, he walked around the corner and out the door. When the door to the office closed, I shivered as if a cold breeze had blown through. Then, Tracy walked into my office. What the hell was that? She asked.
Tune in next week for Mythos Part 2 to witness more of this detective's frightening journey when the night comes out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Allie James. For Brian's work, visit his website at www.brianwalaspa.com or visit Amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Allie's work on Facebook at Allie James Projects.